Uh, Dr. Larson, I think we can start. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this RNA collaborative seminar. This is sponsored by the RNA Society. Um, and today's lectures are coming to you from the RNA Institute here at the University at Albany um, in upstate New York. The RNA Collaborative Seminar Series uh, is sponsored by a number of sponsors, so you'll see them all listed here. Um, we uh, greatly appreciate the support from all of our sponsors and ask um, you to support um, those that are um, uh, companies as well. So the RNA Collaborative Seminar um, does not allow uh, reproduction of any part of these presentations. Uh, do keep in mind that if you'd like to see any part of this presentation later, uh, the talks are going to be uploaded to the RNA Collaborative uh, YouTube site, so you can actually uh, check that out. You'll see that as of today, there are 64 seminars up uploaded here, so you'll be able to find uh, the contents of these seminars um, at this YouTube site later on if you'd like to go back and uh, review the content later. So today we have two uh, really excellent seminars for you. Um, the format of the seminars is we will hear first from uh, Dr. Paolo Forni. Um, Dr. Paolo Forni is an associate professor here. Um, he has a primary position in the Department of Biological Sciences, and he's also an associate member of the RNA Institute. Um, his lab broadly uses the olfactory system um, as a model system to understand molecular principles and gene regulatory networks that underlie neuronal diversity and circuit formation. And so today he is going to tell us about the single cell transcriptome of the basal basal nasal organ of mice, um, looking at new findings and new questions. And uh, I ask that you hold all of your uh, questions and put them into the Q&A rather than into the chat. Um, we will um, hear Dr. Forney give his seminar and then I will have questions at the end. So Dr. Forney, if you could share your screen. Yes, one second, let's try. Let's do share and then. Do you see it? Yes. All right, That's fantastic. Great. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we're doing in my lab. And so let's start. So basically, this is the thing during development, cells differentiate. And so they go from being stem cells to cells that have specific features that, that derive from a restricted activation of specific gene that leads to translation of various RNA in specific proteins that will confer to the cells, the differentiated cells, the ability to perform specific task functions. And so basically during this process of development, we have cells that uh, progressively lose plasticity because there is a reorganization of the chromatin. So when we talk about uh, neurons, neurons are cells that differentiate and during the process of differentiation they acquire the ability to migrate into specific part of the nervous system, central peripheral nervous system, and then to find specific partner, a specific synaptic partner or compatible partners. And then they have the ability to detect certain stimuli, to compute, retransmit the signals, and form functional circuits that are formed in a pretty similar way, one generation after the other. And so these functional circuits uh, give to animals of different species the ability to detect different stimuli. For example, in this case, we have a mouse that sniffs some hair and understand by the smell of the hair that there is a cat. However, sometimes things can go wrong. So we can have inability to detect the stimulus, to form synapses or to transduce the signal. And in that case, we can have defective formation or degeneration of the nervous circuits. And so the ability to detect the stimulus is lost. And in the case of a mouse, this can lead to terrible consequences. So uh, with this uh, uh, 
idea in mind, we uh, uh, want to understand how the identity of a neuron is established. What are the variables that influence and establish the identity of a, 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 a neurons and therefore of a circuit? And how solid is the identity of a neuronal cell once it is completely differentiated and a circuit has been formed? And so to answer some of these uh, broad questions, we use the olfactory system as, as a model. So this is the, the cartoon of the head of a mouse. And if we look inside, we see that there is a brain and a large part of the brain of the mouse is the olfactory bulb that is responsible for the detection of stimuli that come from the main olfactory epithelium, that is a sensory epithelium that will send, uh, detect, process and send information about olfactory cues in the environment volatile odorants. And then there is, in the nose of the mouse, there is a second system, that is the accessory factory system, that where we have the vomeronasal nasal organ, that is a specialized epithelium, that sends a, a, a projection to a, a portion of the factory bulb called the accessory factory bulb. And the vomeronasal nasal organ detects pheromones, semiochemicals, uh, and number of uh, 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 chemical information that are important for sexual and social behavior of rodents and many other species. And so if we look at the vomeronasal nasal organ of, of rodents, it's very interesting because this tiny epithelium that is a specialized olfactory epithelium has two uh, main areas, a basal portion that here is indicated in red and an apical portion that here is, is indicated in green. And here we have two main types of neurons, the basal neurons and the apical neurons. And these sets of neurons send their projection to different portion of the accessory factory bulb. And so the basal neurons express a family of receptor called V2R, and then transduced through the G alpha subunit, G alpha O. And then the apical neurons express the receptors of the V1R family and transduce their signal through the G alpha subunit, G alpha I2. And so one of the questions that we have is how do we get these two main types of neurons? And so if we now look at the vomeronasal organ as this cartoon, in at the tip of this crescent, we have these purple cells that are the stem cell in the marginal zone. This is called the marginal zone. And so these cells express ASC1, that is a VHLH transcription factor, classic of neurons. Then they give rise to cells that become neurogenin 1 positive, that then will turn neuro D1 positive. And between neurogenin 1 and neuro D1, we see the establishment of a dichotomy that will lead to the formation of mature apical neurons express V1R and basal neurons express V2R. So uh, this is the process, they express GAP43 as a mature neuron and as mature neurons, they all express olfactory marker protein that is uh, a marker of mature neurons. So the question is what determines the formation of this dichotomy and what are the different genetic programs that are activated along these differentiation trajectories? And so, as I told you, we see that there is a dichotomy at neuro D1 stage. And so now we know that the cells that will become basal neuron, we, they will express a transcription factor called AP2 epsilon. And the neurons that will become apical neurons will express a transcription factor called MACE2. And the question, the first question I'm going to try to, to, to uh, illustrate it was how, how does this dichotomy happen? So this is uh, AP2 epsilon in the basal neuron, this is MACE2 in the apical neurons. Uh, the, the basal neurons then will express G alpha O and receptor of the V2R family and D1R family, the apical neurons. Great. So uh, we recently published a paper that is what, about what we discover happening here. So before I tell the story, I want to give you a refresh about notch signaling. So notch signaling is a signal that is a, a just a crime a sign, a, a, a signaling. Uh, basically, we have cells that express a ligand, a, del, a, a notch ligand. It could be delta or uh, uh, JAG or other uh, um, notch ligands. And these are expressed on the surface of the cell. And notch is a receptor that is expressed 
on another cell. When a, a, a cell that expresses, for example, delta gets in touch with cells that express a lot of notch, we have the activation of the notch signal that determines the cleavage of the notch receptor and the release of the notch intracellular domain that migrates into the nucleus to activate or regulate transcription. So when notch signal is activated, in many cases we see that the, activate, the gene transcription and the chromatin rearrangement that happens leads to acquisition of broad uh, differential programs. So basically, we, it's a signal that is able to trigger uh, dichotomies to, to uh, induce the differentiation of one cell, that is a cell where the notch signal is activated, and not of the cell that is providing the ligand. And so when we did uh, the single cell sequencing, we published the first single cell sequencing of the VNO recently. So uh, what, what we did, we, we found a lot of cells from all vomeronasal organ sequencing, but what, what we found that was amazing, this was a, a one of those days that you want to jump, I, I, uh, we, we, we identified this Y, and this Y is the dichotomy I mentioned before from the stem cell apical and basal neurons. So here we, I show you the reclustered Y, where we see the stem cells and all the stages that I described before. And so, and, and so we decided to focus and zoom in and recluster this area that you see here in gray and see what happens here. So this is this area reclustered and we can still see the transition towards apical in green and basal lineage. So when we looked at these uh, uh, feature plots, uh, uh, RAGU, identified that there was a differential expression of a transcription factor called BCL11B. And there were cells that were BCL11B positive before and as the dichotomy happens, and cells were BCL11B negative. Okay, so here we put them in red and blue. So BCL11B is not an unknown transcription factor. In fact, in about 10 years, more than 10 years ago, there was this beautiful paper from Enamoto where he showed that if you knock out this transcription factor BCL11B, one thing that happens that in the vomeronasal organ of mice, you lose the basal neurons, you mostly obtain apical neurons. So that was perfect to see BCL11B differentially expressed at the dichotomy. So uh, we decided at this point to do a comparative analysis between the BCL11B positive and the BCL11B negative cells and see what was different. And what we observed is that, and that was again an amazing day in my life, we saw that the, the BCL11B negative were expressing delta-like four, that is a notch ligand, and the BCL11B positive were expressing notch. And so, this makes total sense because we saw that there were a number of genes activated on the BCL and MVB posit positive that are already described as notch targets, including BCL and MVB itself. And so we decided to check now if we had a, a, a corresponding population of delta like four and notch positive cells. And what we observe is that before the dichotomy and as the dichotomy is established, we see that there is a continuum of notch expression on the, uh, uh, on the basal side, by, but on the apical side, we see that there is a phase before and immediately after the dichotomy where notch is not expressed and then is re-expressed afterwards. So we decided to check if we could see the cells going through a just a crime signaling, so a cell, cells carrying delta and cell, cells carrying notch touching each other. And so by histochemistry, we observed that in the vomeronasal organ, in the marginal zone where uh, neurogenesis happen, happens, we could identify with antibodies, cells positive for notch and cells positive for delta. And so we see that delta positive cells were touching the cells expressing notch as in a textbook. And uh, uh, we also confirmed that the cells expressing notch and delta are cells expressing neuro D1. That is exactly what we observed in the single cell uh, uh, feature plots.
So based on this, we came up with a, a, a model that we have uh, these progenitor cells, ASC1 positive, that give rise to, uh, uh, that, that self-replicate as uh, transit amplifying cells, they give rise to cells that then will either express more notch or delta. When notch is activated, we have the expression of BCL11B that will repress the apical program and potentially uh, uh, activate the expression of the, the basal program. And so to test these hypotheses, we, we, we use mouse genetics. And so we use the ASK1 CRE mice, in which basically we decided to knock out not notch expression, starting from these progenitor cells, and see if by uh, destroying notch signaling, we could prevent cells from became, becoming basal neurons. And then we decided to do a, a second approach to induce, uh, uh, to force notch intracellular signaling by using a rosa mouse in which we can induce with the CRE recombinase the expression of notch intracellular domain and force notch intracellular signaling in all the cells and see if we could force all the cells to become basal neurons. And so, uh, before we, we, we did everything, we decided to test the conditions. And so we, we took the ASK1 CRE mice, we induced with tamoxifen the activation of the CRE recombinase and checked the recombination in one, three, seven, and 14 days. So we did this to understand how many days it takes from the, the cells from going from proliferation to be differentiated post-mitotic neurons. And so we observed that if we induce the CRE recombinase in ASK1 positive cells, one day later, we see that most of them are proliferating. Two days later, we see that only about 50% are still proliferating. So we have this expansion. So all these cells were born from these. The next day, we only have 50% that are still cycling. And after seven days, we see that a, a small number is still proliferating, and after 14 days, they're all differentiated neurons. So we decided, so that we observed that, that we, now we know that we can look in a week and have an idea of what is the fate that cells acquire. So we decided to ablate a, a notch in ASK1 positive progenitors, and we wanted to check if first, if we interfere with the proliferation of the progenitors. So what we observed is that one day after uh, ablation of notch in ASK1 positive cells, we don't have changes in proliferation and not any changes in apoptosis. And uh, uh, by checking uh, uh, three days later, same proliferation and no difference in apoptosis. However, we observed that the cells were, there was a dramatic reduction in the proliferative cells positive for BCL11B. BCL11B was going down. So basically what we observed is that if we knock out notch, BCL11B goes down. So based on that, we thought, okay, great. So we are mimicking somehow a BCL11B knockout. So uh, uh, if we ablate uh, B, uh, uh, notch in the ASK1 positive cells, we will push all the cells to acquire the apical fate. And so basically we did the experiment and we observed that uh, uh, one week after the, the induction of the CRE, we have a dramatic reduction in number of cells. that are AP2 epsilon positive that I told you that is the marker for basal neurons. And so basically what you see that the trace cells, they all became apical neurons and not basal neurons. And this was confirmed also by using G-alpha to immunos uh, G-alpha immunostaining that gives us the same result. It's just another marker that shows that the basal neurons are reduced. So basically, this tells us that if we interfere with notch signaling, we decrease BCL11B expression, and we decrease the chances that the cells have to acquire the basal program, and they default to the apical program. So the question was, can we do the opposite. So if we force notch activation by inducing notch intracellular domain in all the cells, we'll, we'll be able to, to do the opposite. And so we induce notch intracellular domain in uh, uh, neurogenic one positive cells. 
And the idea was, can we make them all basal? And so basically, what we observed is that uh, seven days after uh, we did the experiment, uh, um, most of uh, the cells were now becoming basal neurons. Uh, and, and, and after 14 days, they expressed all the markers of the basal neurons. So basically, what you see that the trace cells become basal and they don't become or just one became alpha in this in this illustration so basically we see that we can uh, uh, redirect this dichotomy with not signaling and we learned that after 14 days we need to wait 14 days to see ap2 epsilon going up so that that from the stem cells to have uh, the differentiation marker we need to wait two weeks that is quite a lot of time for, a ma for an animal that lives uh, 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 two years. So, um, okay, what I told you is that we can uh, control this dichotomy. We can force the cells to become basal neurons by inducing notch signaling, and we can make them apical neurons uh, if we uh, uh, ablate the notch signal. So um, this is what we talked about. But the question was, OK, what happens after? OK, AP2 epsilon is expressed after the dichotomy is being established. What is the role of this transcription factor? And does this transcription factor control the progression towards mature vomeronasa sensory neurons expressed in the right receptor? And so um, basically, the question is what happens when we knock out AP2 epsilon, and this is the story. So what we did, we, we checked this AP2 epsilon knockout, and we observed that in the knockouts we have a uh, dramatic loss of uh, a basal uh, uh, marker V2R, of the V2R uh, uh, receptors, and a slight increase in V1R receptors, that are the receptors of the apical and so if we look at uh, the, the immunostaining for the V2R receptors, that are the receptors expressed by the basal vomeronasa sensory neurons, this is a control, and this is a mutant. The difference is, is quite striking. However, uh, when we do, when we did the experiment of tracing the cells using AP2 epsilon CRI in an AP2 epsilon knockout, we observed something very intriguing that while in a control, the cells trace for AP2 epsilon become basal neurons and don't express the receptor of the V1R family. In the knockout, we see that cells that try to express a non-functional AP2 epsilon now express receptor of the V1R family, suggesting that somehow an alternative program that is the apical program got turned on in cells that try to become functionally ba uh, based on neurons. And so the question was, OK, so if we lose AP2 epsilon, the cells start to express uh, some apical markers. So somehow they, they default partially to apical. So this implies that there is a level of plasticity, cellular plasticity, that is still open in a cell that has entered a program and is fully differentiated. Well, without this transcription factor, they, they still retain some uh, uh, plasticity. And so we, 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 we wondered how, how true this idea is. And so we decided to further test this idea by doing the opposite. So what happens if we now force a P2 epsilon in the apical neurons? And so to do that, we had to generate a new Rosa mouse line where we can induce AP2 epsilon expression with the Cree recombinase. And so by doing that, we uh, put ourselves in the condition to express AP2 epsilon ectopically and see if potentially we can do this, if we can redirect the cells to an alternative fate. And so this is a control where we have G alpha O, that is the G protein subunit uh, that is expressed in the basal neurons. This is the mouse with ectopic AP2 epsilon expression, where we see a, a more broad expression and quite weak but detectable expression in cells that seem to be apical cells. So we did a single cell sequencing of controls where we see that we have MACE2, 
that is the transcription factor of the apical neurons, and AP2 epsilon in the basal neurons. When we do the ectopic AP2 epsilon expression, we see AP2 epsilon now that starts to be expressed ectopically in the apical neurons. And when we see that while in the control we have two clear clusters in apical neurons and basal neurons, here they're less well clustered and they, they get closer. And so what happens if we visualize these in a different way? These are the, the genes that are turned on, the mRNA turned on in apical neurons. These are the mRNA that are turned on in basal neurons. And these, after we do the ectopic expression of AP2 epsilon, we have neurons that have a bit, uh, the features a bit of both types. So we, we kind of generate a third type of neuron. And so the question was, all right, how many of these genes are directly controlled by AP2 epsilon? And so in order to do that, we did cut and run. And uh, to make a long story short, we basically found that around a third of the uh, basal and rich genes are, seem to be activated by AP2 epsilon. And some, and about a third of the apical genes seem to be downregulated by AP2 epsilon. And so this tells us that AP2 epsilon has both a role in uh, activating or sustaining the activation of basal gene and contributing to the repression of the alternative program. So basically what I told you today is that uh, in the vomeronasal organ, there is a default program that is the apical program. And in fact, most of the vertebrates that have a vomeronasal organ have this type of neurons. And these are expressed MACE2. In rodents and marsupials, we have a second type of neurons. And these neurons form because there is activation of notch signaling. And so basically, if we lo lose notch signaling, the cells default to apical. If we force notch signaling, we can turn them into basal. If we lose AP2 epsilon, the cells partially acquire uh, apical features. And if we ectopically express AP2 epsilon, we can do the opposite. And so this tells us that there is a level of cellular plasticity that we can detect a single cell, a level of single cell sequencing in fully differentiated neurons. And I think this could be an interesting way, an interesting key to interpret neuropsychiatric uh, 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 developmental uh, 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 disorders or uh, degenerative disorder of the nervous system. So this is my group, uh, nice, young and diverse. Uh, these are the people that did the, the work I presented today. These are my funding sources. Marcos Costas and Megan collaborated with us for the, for the Caterran, and that's all. Thank you, Paolo. Excellent talk, as usual. Thank you. We have time for maybe one quick question from the audience. Um, so... The question is, are there any ways the plasticity of these neurons can be used? Yes, to publish a paper. Uh, <laughs> no, is it uh, plasticity here is cellular plasticity. It, 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 it's, it, I know it's confusing. When we talk about neuronal plasticity, is their ability to form new connection. Here is cellular plasticity that is how reprogrammable the cells are. And I think is not very useful. Well, for sure, Neuro, nature uses this plasticity. For, for sure, that, it, that is something that nature wisely used to make things different, to make mm, probably new circuits, and maybe uh, if they are advantageous to retain them in next generations. Excellent. So it looks like we're right on time. So um, thank you, Paolo. We should move on to the next speaker. Um, so our next speaker. Um, is Dr. Kalak Reddy. So uh, Dr. Kalak Reddy uh, is a research faculty member here at the RNA Institute. Uh, he is also an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences here at the University at Albany. And um, Kalak's lab generally functions to look at investigating RNA dysregulation in neuromuscular disease. And today he's going to tell us about the functional consequences of disease associated in the zine incorporation into DNA. So, Kalak, you can share your slides.
Can you see my slides? Yes, looks great. Excellent. Okay. So. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for having the opportunity to be able to present in this seminar series. And uh, thank you, Mindy, for the introduction. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be able to share some of the work that we're doing elucidating um, the molecular mechanisms for a rare but fatal neurodevelopmental disorder, which is caused by variants in the ITPA gene and is associated with misincorporation of the non-canonical nucleotide inosine into RNA. So we and others previously identified um, biallelic uh, null variants in the gene called ITPA, which causes a rare neurodevelopmental infantile disorder that's characterized by epileptic encephalopathy as well as dilated cardiomyopathy. And so what you can appreciate from this plot is that in these patients, there is essentially complete loss of, in many of these patients, complete loss of this ITPase protein. And prior to the report of these uh, null variants in patients, there was a ITPA knockout null mouse generated, which recapitulates a fatal condition in which the mice basically uh, die um, typically within two weeks after birth and represent a dilated cardiomyopathy condition resembling the human ITPase deficiency. And so what is the ITPase enzyme? So ITP encodes the inosine triphosphate pyrophosphatase enzyme, or ITPase. And so this is a uh, homodimeric protein, and it catalyzes the following reaction. It basically hydrolyzes non-canonical nucleotides, um, inosine as well as xanthazine, in both the deoxyribo as well as the riboforms into their monophosphate form. And so this is a busy slide, but I'd like to draw your attention to IMP here, which is a precursor in the, um, in the de novo purine synthesis pathway. And so IMP is necessary for the generation of both AMP as well as GMP, and as, acts as a precursor in this pathway. And it can also form um, XMP in order to generate GMP. And both of these are precursors. And normally AMP and both GMP get phosphorylated to form ATP and DTP, which are necessary components of the cellular nucleotide pool. But these precursors can also themselves become phosphorylated, forming ITP as well as XTP or xanthosine triphosphate. Um, and the ITP's enzyme functions to restrict this accumulation in the nucleotide pool. And furthermore, the riboforms can then themselves be reduced into the deoxyriboforms to form the deoxyinazine triphosphate as well as the deoxyinazine, deoxyxanthazine triphosphate. And so ITPase hydrolyzes the non-canonical nucleotides to prevent their accumulation in these pools. And so in the absence of this ITPase enzyme, what you get is the accumulation of these non-canonical nucleotides within the nucleotide pool. And so this can have various detrimental consequences to the cell and is outlined in this um, figure. So basically with the accumulation of, for example, ITP or DITP, you can have misincorporation during DNA replication or misincorporation during transcription into the DNA or RNA respectively. And while in the DNA misincorporation could be targeted through active DNA repair processes to prevent the accumulation of inosine. In RNA, there isn't a comparable RNA repair pathway that's able to restrict the misincorporation of inosine. And so you get misincorporation of inosine into the RNA, which could theoretically have a lot of detrimental downstream consequences to the cell. And some of these are outlined here, for example, in RNA processing, localization, mRNA surveillance, as well as translation. And so normally inosine is present in RNA, but it arises through the activity of these um, enzymes, ADAT and ADAR, which catalyze specific deamination of adenosine into inosine. 
And so this is a highly regulated process, but in the absence of IGPAs, you have misincorporation of inosine within the RNA and hence could have a lot of um, detrimental effects. And so just to summarize what we previously found by generating these ITPAs null models is that there's substantial misincorporation of the inosine nucleotide in RNA. And so this is evident in patient cells as well as mouse embryonic stem cells, as well as various embryonic mouse tissues that we generated using CRISPR engineering. And what we didn't see is inosine being misincorporated into the DNA, which is again consistent with the potential for DNA repair factors to potentially um, excise misincorporated inosine. And we didn't see any corresponding DNA damage or mitochondrial DNA instability or mitochondrial dysfunction. However, as I mentioned, there isn't an RNA repair pathway to prevent inosine misincorporation into RNA. And so there's substantial misincorporation could result in a lot of downstream detrimental effects. And so notably, for example, in the embryonic mouse heart tissue, there's inosine present at a frequency of approximately one in 400 bases. And so this is in total RNA. So it's very abundant in these tissues in the cellular RNA. And so we were really interested in determining what the consequences of this inosine misincorporation were. And so previously we carried out microarray and proteomic analysis. And as you can imagine, we were actually quite surprised to see that there was essentially no major deregulation as a result of pretty substantial inosine misincorporation. And so comparing both mRNA or protein expression, we saw that there wasn't a clear dysregulation. But then we started to look into um, subsets of transcripts, um, hypothesizing that perhaps maybe um, certain subsets may be disproportionately affected. And something that was interesting is when we analyzed a panel of transcripts that are associated with cardiomyopathy, so this includes factors like Titan, Ryanodine receptor 2, NKX 2-5, or TNNT2, we did see that there was a modest but significant reduction, and this is qPCR from the same tissue, that there was a modest and significant reduction of some of the longer transcripts relative to some of the um, shorter transcripts. So this indicated that perhaps um, there was an effect of transcript length where they're disproportionately affected by inosine misincorporation. And so when we reanalyze that microarray data by sorting the transcripts by length, what we notice is going from the top 1,000 longest transcripts going up to the top 100, we actually saw that there was a significant disproportionate downregulation in the very long transcripts compared to the shorter ones. And so when we reanalyzed the proteomics in the same manner, we noticed that this was also evident at the protein level. So if we sorted by increase in protein size, we noticed that the very long pro or the very large proteins, which included, for example, titan and ryanidine receptor 2 associated with cardiomyopathy, that they showed evidence of significant downregulation. And so it was interesting that perhaps the long transcripts and proteins were disproportionately affected, but the mechanism for how this downregulation might have been occurring was not clear. But there was an interesting study that was recently published, which challenged the longstanding notion that inosine is efficiently decoded as a guanosine in the context of translation. So in this study, when they placed inosine at particular positions within a test codon, which was, in vitro trans or which was in vitro transcribed, and then a peptide was generated and subjected to mass spec, what they found was that altering the inosine position, depending on the context, could result in decoding primarily as guanosine, which we would expect, but also in cases, it was also decoded as adenosine, and even in some cases, as uracil. And so, the conclusion is that depending on the context of inosine in RNA, it actually may be decoded as other nucleotides in addition to guanosine, which is a longstanding view. And additionally, the presence of inosine clusters was sufficient to stimulate translation stalling. And so we were particularly interested in this in the context of disease-associated inosine misincorporation that we see uh, due to HPA's deficiencies. So in order to test this, we 
utilized a very simple in vitro transcription translation system to see if this misincorporation could trigger translation effects. And so we utilized a firefly luciferase construct under the control of a T7 promoter. And during in vitro transcription, in addition to the canonical nucleotides, we spiked in increasing amounts of inosine triphosphate. And so with this assay, we're able to generate uh, mRNAs encoding luciferase with varying levels of inosine misincorporated. And we confirmed that these were stable transcripts and weren't showing evidence of um, uh, degradation or um, decay in any way from the in vitro transcription itself. And also we confirmed that the inosine was being misincorporated into these transcripts using mass spectrometry and found that with increasing amounts of ITP in the nucleotide pool, we did see um, a proportionate increase in the inosine being misincorporated into this RNA. And so we had these RNA substrates that we could evaluate. However, we weren't clear at this stage what the distribution looked like. And so in order to look at inosine content within these RNAs, we utilized Oxford nanopore direct RNA sequencing. And so here, with Oxford nanopore sequencing, as RNA enters a protein pore, there's an ionic current that's applied through the pore. And so bases that disrupt this ionic current have a unique signature, which can be interpreted by the nanopore base calling algorithm to decipher the nucleotide. But it should be noted that these base calling algorithms don't actually directly discriminate inosine. And so when we sequence inosine containing RNAs relative to control, what we notice is that there's an increase in the average base substitution frequency, which can be used as a proxy for inosine misincorporation. Because it still does have a unique ionic current dis uh, disruption, this comes, off, comes across as a base substitution. And so if we map the base substitution frequency across the luciferase transcript, what we notice is in the inosine containing um, library, which is shown in red, you can see that in most of the peaks, there's an increase in the average base substitution frequency consistent with inosine being misincorporated into this RNA. And so if we subtract the signal from the control RNA, so this is another way to display the same data, what we see for, is for most positions, there's an elevation in the base substitution frequency supporting inosine misincorporation um, into the RNA. And what we can derive from this misincorporation um, pattern is that it's generally pretty stochastic. So in the presence of elevated inosine, it seems to be misincorporated throughout the transcript. And there weren't very clear um, evidence for hotspots. However, when we do look at it in terms of um, per base accuracy, we did notice that there is a hierarchy of misincorporation um, positions. So we saw that inosine is primarily misincorporated in place of guanosine. But interestingly, it can be misincorporated in place of essentially all of the bases, but with um, altered uh, preferences. So we then took this in vitro transcribed um, RNA that contained the inosine misincorporated, and then we evaluated the effects of in vitro translation using a rabbit reticulocyte lysate assay. And so with increasing amounts of inosine in the RNA, what we noticed is when we measure luminescence as a readout for protein activity, we saw a clear reduction in um, luminescence with increasing inosine misincorporation. And so we initially, we would have predicted that in the presence of inosine, there could be both the outcome of reduced protein abundance as well as potentially miscoding. And so we also looked at protein abundance. And what was interesting is that, and so this was done again with the in vitro um, translation assay and rabbit reticulocyte lysate in the presence of 35S methionine labeling. And so when we quantified full-length luciferase, it was interesting that while there was a significant reduction in the abundance of the protein, this was relatively modest compared to the reduction in the activity of the protein. So this actually supported um, the effect of miscoding to potentially be greater than the effect on the abundance of protein produced. And so this was interesting, but it was limited to in vitro findings. So in collaboration with Dr. Mark Handley at the University of Leeds, 
we analyzed the effects in an ITPA null cell line. And so Dr. Hanley generated using CRISPR engineering an ITPA null H9C2 cardiomyoblast cell line. Uh, and here you can see in this cell line that there's complete absence of this ITPA protein. And there's a significant uh, increase in the misincorporation of inosine within the total RNA. And then Dr. Handley carried out polysome profiling in both the wild type and null cells and found that there was a noticeable reduction in the polysome peak, suggesting that the rate of translation was indeed reduced in the cell line compared to the wild type. However, the inosine misincorporation in these cell lines could theoretically, since we're assessing total RNA, be into tRNA, ribosomal RNA, or mRNA, all of which could potentially impact translation. So in order to elucidate this a little further, what we did is we integrated our in vitro transcription and translation system with the cellular assays. And so here we're looking at translation of the mRNA that we were initially using for our in vitro translation system, but in a cellular context. So again, we used RNA that we generated through in vitro transcription with varying levels of the inosine misincorporated. And then these were transfected into the H9C2 cells, and we again measured luminescence and quantified the abundance of the protein. And what was striking is while the overall pattern was generally similar with increasing inosine misincorporation into the RNA, you actually see a reduced um, luminescence. You actually saw a, a sharp drop off between the 0.1 millimolar and 1 millimolar ITP RNA fraps. And this was also evident at the in the H9 uh, in the ITPA null cells, where you again see a very sharp drop off. And an another interesting note is we actually saw that the um, overall luminescence was higher in the null cells, but we did note these cells were growing a little slower. So it could just be that these cells were more receptive to RNA transfection. But in both cases, the pattern of reduction for um, luminescence was very similar. And again, this sharp drop off between 0.1 and 1 millimolar was um, very apparent and was interesting. And so when we quantified the abundance of the uh, luciferase protein produced, again, it was evident both in the wild type and null that we saw a similar pattern where with increasing inosine misincorporation, you do reduce the amount of protein produced, but there was a very clear drop off again between the 0.1 and 1 millimolar preps where there was a sharp drop off. And by the 10 millimolar prep, there's essentially no protein being produced, which was very interesting. And so when we quantify this, you can see that very clearly that essentially there's no protein being produced at the 10 millimolar um, RNA preps. And so perhaps with the inosine misincorporation, there could actually be two outcomes, um, which could involve, for example, at lower abundance of inosine in the RNA, that there may be more permissive translation resulting in miscoding errors, but perhaps with sufficiently high levels of inosine misincorporation, the cells may start to activate some of the mRNA surveillance pathways that then target those RNAs for degradation. And this was evident in the cell system, but if you remember in the in vitro translation system, the reduction in the abundance was relatively modest, suggesting that with even really high levels of inosine being misincorporated, they were still permissively being translated. So maybe in the in vitro translation system, there aren't the same quality control mechanisms that are available in order to target those RNAs for degradation. And so that may illustrate some of the uh, disparity between the in vitro and the cell systems. And so this is something that we're really interested in um, pursuing further in terms of the mRNA quality uh, control and surveillance pathways. And so just to summarize what um, I've told you today, um, we previously found that null variants in ITPA cause a fatal neurodevelopmental disorder and is associated with incorporation of inosine into RNA at high level. And in our in vitro work, we find the inosine misincorporation appears to be stochastic, but does show base preferences, primarily in G positions. And inosine misincorporation functionally may hinder translation, which we find both in vitro and in cells, and may underline one of the potential mechanistic links between HPA's deficiency and the potential pathogenic outcome. 
So this is something that we're gonna be interested in pursuing further. And while today I talked about primarily the translation effects, the presence of the inosine in these cellular models could disrupt various downstream consequences. So moving forward, we're really interested in utilizing um, human IPSC models where we're differentiating them into uh, affected cell types, including neurons and cardiomyocytes, and looking at the transcriptome profiles, as well as these other um, outcomes of the potential misincorporation of inosine into the RNA. And so I'll just jump to my acknowledgements, and I'd like to thank um, the members of my lab that worked on this project, which includes Jacob Schroeder, who's a talented uh, PhD student who carried out all the Oxford nanopore sequencing work, as well as um, Illumina sequencing, which I didn't have time to share today. Uh, Lindsay Jones was a, a fantastic former um, research technician in my lab, and she was involved in all the in vitro translation, as well as cellular um, luciferase translation assays. And this work is an ongoing collaboration with Dr. Mark Handley at the University of Leeds in UK. And so uh, Dr. Handley was kind enough to provide the H9C2 null um, HPA cell line for us to evaluate translation in and also carried out the polysome profiling in this study. And also I'd like to acknowledge our colleagues um, in the RNA Institute, both uh, past and present members of the Birkeland Lab, as well as our colleagues, Tom Begley, Gabrielle Fuchs, Keyshawn Lin and Ryan, Meg, uh, Ryan Meng from the RNA Institute, as well as funding sources. And so with that, I'd like to stop there and I'll be happy to take any questions. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kalak. That was an excellent presentation. I'd just like to remind everyone, if you have questions, please type them into the question and answer box so that they could be addressed. Um, and I guess I'll uh, start out with one. Um, I thought the implication that you have mRNA surveillance um, mechanisms that may be activated um, with the inosine um, um, increases may, is really interesting. Um, I was wondering if you have any evidence from any of your RNA profiling or anything that suggests that these pathways may be activated? No, so we haven't specifically looked at whether there's activation of these prof um, pathways, but that's something that we're definitely going to be evaluating moving forward. And also in the case of the transfection studies, because I don't think we get the RNA generally high enough in the systems that we're using. Um, so what we'd like to do is see for, you know, subset of transcripts where we do get really high levels of inosine misincorporation, whether, you know, um, those could be affected. And so part of it is also trying to profile the inosine misincorporation in the transcriptome to see which classes of transcripts and genes have, you know, um, higher inosine misincorporation associated, which may be selectively targets of NMD or other forms of decay. Yeah. I was also interested that um, you see such high um, inosine misincorporation in the heart relative to the other tissues. You only showed a few tissues, but I wondered if you could speculate as to why you're seeing it's affecting the heart um, over other tissues. Yeah, that's a good question. It's something um, we think about as well. I think there's a um, couple of scenarios for that. I think, you know, one of the things is um, there's certain routes that you can take to generate IT, uh, ITP. One of them is through phosphorylation of IMP, but also through deamination of ATP. So if you have tissues that have really high energetics, you know, maybe if there's a lot of ATP generation, um, you could then have greater deamination resulting in more ITP and more incorporation, as well as the metabolic pathways that generate the purine uh, nucleotides could also be uh, elevated in certain tissues. So these are some of the things that we're gonna be looking at in some of the you know, um, differentiation systems and other tissues as well. And I wondered also if that disproportionately affects tissues like the heart, where there are a lot of proteins that are involved in like um, cardiac muscle function that are really large. Um, and if that would disproportionately then have negative effects on heart function as well. Yeah, that's another good question that, um, you know, we're really interested in, especially also in the context of the brain, because it's also um, epileptic encephalopathy. So if there's brain proteins that are really large, also that, you know, disproportionately affected. So this is something that we're interested in looking into. Right. Are there any questions from the, the audience? Just one other question. Um, also, are you interested in developing different therapeutic avenues for 
of these diseases? Yeah, so I mean, it would be it would be great to understand sort of the pathways a little better before we try and uh, determine therapeutics for it. Right now, we're still focused on trying to identify sort of the um, the mechanisms leading to the incorporation. So, at some point, yeah, it would be nice to identify some targets. Great. I guess we'll stay tuned um, for the next time we hear you speak. So here we are with a mechanistic identification. So. Um, if there are no questions from the audience, um, it's almost, uh, our hour's almost up. So uh, thank everyone for attending and um, look forward to seeing everyone at the next um, RNA Collaborative presentation.